Hello friends, my name is Steve and we are here today for the Page Chewing Friday Conversation and tonight our guest is author Michael Sisko. Michael, thank you for joining us. Hi, thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> thanks, for, uh, thanks for coming by and hanging out with us on a Friday night. Mm -hmm. Thanks for making time. So for people who aren't familiar with your work, uh, how would you describe your work and what you do? Um, well, I've been writing novels for a while now and while they've sort of undergone a sort of development over time, generally uh, I try to write the weirdest stuff I can think of, but I don't like the sort of writing that's weird for its own sake or that just is weird just for the sake of, of being kooky. Like I want there to be at least some kind of emotional center to the story, some sort of reason why you're reading it. So, um, yeah, kind of surreal, dreamlike, um, often horrific, some fantasy. Um, so I move around. I use a lot of different genre elements just, uh, you know, to, to satisfy me. And I draw on, on literary models as well. I try to read pretty widely and steal tricks from everywhere I can find them. Anybody knows what they're doing. I want to know how they do it. So in case I want to do it myself. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I've written books that are uh, typically the I, the only other thing I would just say generally is that I pay a lot of attention to style. I want the text to have a distinct flavor. Um, I want it to have, have a distinct sound. Um, I like to play around with the words on the page a bit so that they it's not just sort of about something but it's doing something or it is something so it feels alive in your hands that's the kind of thing ever since Grover said don't turn the page in the book with the monsters uh, uh, I was I was always responding to any book that talked back to you or that felt like it knew you were reading it and was aware of that and playing with that that I, I can never get enough of that sort of thing so in a way I try to do that with most or all of my books and you mentioned you look for for inspirations and for tricks and other other books. What's the most surprising place you found a trick to use in? Ooh, surprising. Um, <laughs> I guess in like uh, really really dry academic philosophical books, or you know things like Spinoza or Kant. You know because um, uh, just my particular academic interests went, took me in that direction. And reading them, especially with Kant, initially it's so dry and so complicated, you just can't follow it. You just want to, you just have to kind of go with it for a while and see if you can get the gist of it. And what I found was that over time, it's not that I was necessarily understanding it better, but I was getting this kind of perverse enjoyment about just how dry, how technical it could be, like how, how you could just sustain the boredom for so long and you could just talk about these really dry as dust like you really dry like you think you've read dry like this is dry and so then the idea is well if you can make that self-aware and funny or or you can play with that now that becomes interesting and suddenly i get this appetite to read Kant. i want to read more Kant. i'm starting to get off on how how kind of te not tedious it is but like the it, just the dryness, the abstractness, it starts to get appealing. So things like that in textbooks and legal documents and things like that, contracts, just looking for a way to, because there's something, um, if you can make a like contractual language funny or banker's language funny or or terms of service language funny, <laughs> just by, not by lampooning it and just sticking goofy clowns all over it, but like getting into the language and doing it and turning it against itself and warping it, then everybody recognizes what you're doing right away, and they start. They love it. It's just because it, it's 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 turning that language back on itself and sort of weaponizing its its tedium and its bore and its complexity against its own purposes, and then that becomes sort of then it becomes enjoyable. So I guess that's the most surprising place. It, you know, I wouldn't have gone. Thought I would have been uh, literarily influenced by this sort of thing, and um, I am insofar as I tamper with it and vandalize it but or use it to my own ends but uh, it, it is an influence i have to say plic you you oh sorry it's my mic sorry, it's my mic uh, getting yeah, feedback here yeah, feedback here uh, sorry is that sorry, better is that better i can hear you yeah. I, i'm not sure, I'm not what, sure the what the feedback, feedback is, is but, is, but uh, uh 
Let me make sure. Not on my. Windows yeah, it's not on my end. I can hear you just fine. No, I only have uh, this one window open, so not really sure. Um, mm, that's right. Any, any that's case, that better? Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I guess I guess my question is, Michael, like, yeah. is it important to have humor and be funny in horror? Like, is that like a, a attention release? Is that like is that a, like a necessity you believe for uh, you know something that can be you know potentially be like gruesome or something really psychologically disturbing to have that humorous element? in in horror yeah i think it that's a tricky question but i think um i wouldn't say you have to have it i think i've read horror stories that aren't that don't have any humor in them but certainly if you have a longer anything long you can't sustain the same tone indefinitely people just get tired you need a break and then you you know so things need to calm down so you can start to ramp them back up again because people run out of stamina for the feeling and humor can definitely do that and also i think humor creeps in because it's a way of protecting yourself against making it too scary you know like if i'm just interested in being terrified i can go watch documentaries about human beings doing awful things to each other that are totally real this really happened and it's like that's scary but it's not fun I don't enjoy it. That's not what I... So sometimes when a horror movie or a story winks at you or makes jokes, um, you know, that's its way of diffusing, the, of letting you know this is all in fun. Uh, or sometimes it's about characterization. You know, the funny characters are going to be more sympathetic characters. They might be more relatable. It's a great way to get efficiently into someone's point of view by seeing what they think is funny. So as a characterization instrument, it's... It's interesting, but like if you look at those all the franchise killer movies, like the like the first Nightmare movie was a pretty serious horror movie. By the time you get to five and six, I mean it's car, it's just he's it's they're comedies. They're basically just grisly comedies uh, where Freddy Krueger is a comedic character who's cracking jokes. And there's a sometimes I think we like to domesticate the villain. Like in the first movie is scary, but then as we start to like the villain, now we're kind of sort of rooting for the villain a little bit, and we make friends with him, and he does, well, he wouldn't kill me, or something like, he's like my buddy now, and we're on a better pay, we, I understand where he's coming from, and so the, the humor there, it can be a way of, of altering your relationship to the story, so then now it's about an anti-hero, or, or something like that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, like, the Haunting of Hill House isn't a book that's like knee slap and funny. It's a very effective horror story. Um, there are moments in the story where you see foreshadowing happen, and sometimes when you have that knowing feeling, that can make you laugh a little bit. That's a different kind of laugh, though. That's that sort of a, <laughs> I know what that's going to be. That's sort of knowing in advance, or that understanding the foreshadowing, the seeing it before it happens, the knowing more than the characters. That plays in. That can also play into it. So it's. I think it's. It's complex. I like like humor just because I like humor and um, I don't. But some of the stuff I write can be. I can write pretty grim also. So I, I guess it would feel weird to exclude it and to say no jokes. You know that feels sort of like there's a whole dimension of human life that I'm ignoring now mm -hmm. and why. Um, so, but whether it's essential. I think it depends on what you're trying to do. I think if you're Stephen Graham Jones, you're going to want to have some humor mixed in there. And in some ways, it's going to make the horror more effective. I think that may be it. It makes the horror more effective very often. Um, whether it's dark humor or it's irony or it's the funny character dying where you feel it more. Um, or if the, you know, if the villain, you want to show the villain has a point, so you give him a good joke or two. And you say, well, he does have a point. And, uh, you know, that dynamic keeps things from getting to be too flat, too stale, too pat. So I guess that was a kind of an all-over-the-place answer, but it's because humor is, is it just, you can't put it in a box. It's so much bigger than comedy as a label. It's just, you see it in, in Westerns and science fiction, you see it in fantasy, you see it all over the place. So it's like we're not human if we're not making jokes in a way. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think it's, it's one of those things where um, it's, I think you hit the nail on the head that for me as a writer and a reader, humor is one of those things that it's just part of life the same way, you know, romance and sex and, you know, mm -hmm. problems. It's it's all intertwined in that, you know, this makes something realistic because it's an element of life and thus in fiction you include it. 
like yeah. naturally organically it's just part of you know of everyone's life right it's one of those common commonalities those common elements so yes. um but yeah. I, I personally love when um you know and i haven't read extensively the amount of horror someone like steve has but i have read 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 some and certainly some of the some of the really popular writers like stephen king and dean Coots and stuff and i love when they put in something really ironic funny mm -hmm. just for me it just breaks up attention too and i i like that i like that element but also because it is part of you know life right cracking a joke um and especially something like the black humor dark humor um mm -hmm. you know i really appreciate that because you know it can be you know funny as hell first of all right and uh, i think because of my job and the kind of jobs i've had that that's just a real um you know that's a real aspect of 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 the kind of jobs I've had, like that black humor, where you know it's things that maybe you should, probably should be laughing at, and then mixed company you wouldn't laugh at because it, it would be considered insensitive, um, mm -hmm. you know. But 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 kind of something that you know it's it's it's, it's something that you do end up, up end up laughing at uh, in in and amongst uh, the people that do the same line of work. So it's uh, you know and one day you know you always wonder, am I? Is there something wrong with me because I'm laughing at that? And you know there probably is. Uh, no, but. You know, um, if, it's the if, way we if you don't laugh at it, then it does something else to you, something worse. And so you let it out. It's a way of acting it out. Like, you know, I was just reading something about some people who've been in a war zone and it had been some very rough fighting. And they were that later on, they put on skits in their camp, you know, just mocking the two sides and so forth. And you can see they had to do something like that. They needed it for breathing room. They needed to get control of it somehow and turn it into something that they that is otherwise it's going to overwhelm them so that's another aspect in which when you confront something horrific the the humor in, can emphasize that make it instead of being um, a distraction or just a momentary lull it's something that that never it doesn't de depart from the overall idea of horror it's not like there's suddenly this chunk of a sitcom dropped in the middle of your story it's it's something that that shows the characters processing what happened to them trying to get a grip on it trying to get up on top of it and so often what you can do is introduce like a huma humorous moment where they're all sort of laughing it off and then the ghost or whatever will sort of go eh, and it'll kind of just sort of like yeah I'd laugh it up buddy but you know I'm still in charge here right and so and that that's nice because you're like oh yes ha 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 but uh you know we're not actually free that that's a nice if you can pull that off that's a really nice little thing to be able to put into a story and we had a question from Chris, uh, whose question is, is there a role for absurd ludicrous to highlight the way that things we think of ordinarily are actually extraordinary in the same way we think horrific can to make us look with fresh eyes? Um, no, absolutely. Of course, the, yes, the answer is yes. Uh, and happy birthday, Chris, by the way. Um, oh, yep, so. Uh, happy birthday, Chris. Yeah, the big five zero. I think. Although he might not want me to mention his age, but he mentioned it on Twitter, so I assume it's okay. But uh, welcome to the club. But uh, the, for the the absurd or the ludicrous, yeah, that's what it is, really. It's it's sort of where you you stop and you say, wait, what am I doing? What do we do? What is this? And uh, suddenly it pops out at you that, that what you're doing doesn't make sense, or it only makes sense kind of locally. But you step out of that locality, and suddenly what you're doing looks looks absurd. So. Um, yeah, I mean, I always loved uh, anything that ever was since I was a kid. You know, I used to love the cartoons where everything went upside down and backwards and everything was wrong. And I sort of liked, I think kids just instinctively like that sort of thing because you're telling them, I don't have children, so I don't know, but, uh, you know, you're telling them ruthlessly how they have to be. So I think they get a little sour about it. And so they like to see it, everything flipped on their on its head. So flipping things on their on their heads can can be enlightening. It can be a way of taking you out of your. It can show you what you're taking for granted, and so uh, I think that's part of the appeal of absurdism in in fiction and, and ludicrous or surreal writing is the way that it um, it shows you the nonsense inside the sense. Um, the horrific depends on what we're talking about but with the horrific it can show you things that aren't supposed to be possible that happen and the absurd kind of shows you what's normally going on so there can that you don't see so there are places where that can overlap um, 
I'm trying to think of a good example and I'm having trouble off the top of my head, but I guess if you're looking at life, like if you're looking at life from the point of view of a Lovecraftian entity, then, or an elder thing from, from the mountains of madness, this human scurrying around doing their business and taking themselves terribly seriously all looks kind of ridiculous. You know, when you have an eons long perspective, you see this a lot where you can confront godlike characters with, in, with long lifespans or even like vampires or whatever. And they say, oh, that again. I've been alive for 3,000 years. I've seen this come and go. It happens. Humans think they're so important. So that, that's a place where absurdity dovetails very naturally into a horror story. Um, and a lot of absurdism is also horrific. You know, I mean, again, if you look at things like Apocalypse Now, that's a horrific movie about war, but it's also full of absurdity. You know, it's like a Playboy bunny's dancing in the, in the jungle and so forth. You're like, what the hell are they? What's going on? Um, and, uh, what are they thinking? And so uh, that's a place where horror and, and the absurd can also dovetail in the other direction, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Yeah, that is that absurd. <laughs> some absurdity in it. I just want to say happy birthday again to, to, uh, to Chris. Congratulations. Yeah, yeah, happy birthday and welcome to the five zero club it's it's, yep. it's not bad on this side it's not bad you know? yeah the weather water's fine <laughs> <laughs> and uh nice of the guys to arrange a cisco talk for me to listen to my birthday we, we aim to please chris thanks yeah. for the fish coming by. don't say i never got you yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> Also wanted to congratulate you on the Stoker nomination. Oh, what was yeah. that Thank like? you very much. That's a big deal. That's a big Thank deal. You very much. What was uh, being nominated like? What was that oh, process like? Being nominated? Well, the, being nominated was about uh, hearing from it from, from friends on Twitter, and they're saying congratulations. I'm like, what on what? And it took me a minute to, to figure it out. Um, but yeah, it, it was just the nomination process was just n just being notified. You know that uh, that I'd received that I'd. Uh, been they were at least uh, there was a preliminary ballot and then there's the the proper ballot and uh, I was fully expecting to get knocked off the preliminary ballot but I wasn't somehow I survived uh, and so um, that was that's it and then they contact you and they there's a certificate that you that they give you um, which is nice you know so you you they, you can prove that you're not fibbing when you tell people you're Stoker nominated and uh, so I mean if I can I'm planning to go to StokerCon this year I've never been so uh, and a lot of people I've been sort of uh, I know electronically but not in in, in the the flesh in the new flesh we can meet and and finally meet and talk with each other a bit and that, I'm looking forward to that that's always the most fun part of any con is just meeting other folks you've been hearing about and reading for a long time and you finally get to talk with them that's the that's the cool part so um, whoever wins I'm I'm very pleased I'm obviously very pleased and very flattered to have been nominated so the, the book that was nominated is a nonfiction book about uh, weird fiction. I just happened to have a copy of it right here. What do you know? <laughs> just uh, Where did this come from? So yeah, Paul Graves put it out. It's my book about weird fiction, a genre study. And it, it's it's gratifying to get it nominated because I did. this is the result of a lot of years of work. Um, it's a pretty rigorous scholarly book. So um, it's, it's nice to get uh, acknowledged for it. Um, so yeah, that's the story so far. Um, that maybe Elder is to it. I don't know. It's up to the voters. That's that's a good story. Good story already. So yeah, good start. Yeah, very congratulations. Good. That's and and I think those awards where um, your peers and readers and people who are part of the society um, vote, I think those are the most gratifying ones. If I'm not yeah. like that's how I feel. I'm not sure if you the same, Michael. Where you know, and you don't even you know you don't even know that. That that someone people have nominated you, you get you get selected. Yeah. I, I think those are the the really gratifying ones. And of course, this mm -hmm. is pretty well. I think a lot of people would consider the most prestigious uh, literary uh, award in the horror sphere. Uh, so you know, once again, congratulations. That's a big deal, man. That's a thank big you, deal. thank you very much. Shucks, it's like uh, um, you know, like my face was red for quite a few days after I got the word of that. I was sort of in, I didn't believe it at first. I'm like, well. A couple of three people had to tell me, and then I was like, well, I guess this is, and then they contacted me. So it's like, okay, now I know it's for real. Gulp. So, uh, <laughs> you know, so um, yeah, I, my, my deepest gratitude to everybody, who, to the nominators and voters. Uh, 
So if, if you know, I, if this is as far as it goes, it's, it's already gone further than I thought it would have gone. Because you know, you never know. With a book like this, you're just thinking this could, you know, this will drop stillborn from the press. Three people will read it, and it'll vanish forever. So the idea that more than a few people are reading it is is very nice, uh, indeed. So I, I would like to think that uh, somebody got something out of it. Um, <laughs> that was my thinking there. Do, do you um, what what have you found? Um, I don't want to say more gratifying, but what's the gratification you get writing uh, something that's very academic like that versus writing fiction? Like what? Do, what? Like what's the, the 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 thing that gets you? Okay, great. I'm going to write this very scholarly, do all this hard research, and you know, like what what gets you stoked about that versus just letting your creative imagination, writing speculative fiction, just letting it go wild and and dreaming up whatever you want, essentially, and putting it down a bit. In a word, uh, spite, uh, you know, proving that you can do it too, <laughs> proving that, um, you know, like I, the, I mean, this started a long time ago when I was getting my degree and, you know, this was in the 90s and there was all this theory and I wasn't really prepared for theory and it threw me and, but I didn't want to just reject it out of hand. I wanted to see if they, what they were talking about, I wanted to be able to evaluate it legitimately and, um, Ultimately, I think I had a chip on my shoulder, and I wanted to prove that I could do something like that, uh, that I could write something really rigorous and and um, deep that way. And but you know, then I guess as as I pushed on, I became you know I, I became more engrossed in in reading, you know, uh, more theoretical or philosophical stuff. I found uh, in fascinating ideas embedded in there, oftentimes uh, con ideas that were. Um, even upsetting or or challenging things that would really challenge my assumptions and and turn my and really sort of threaten uh, cherished ideas and just sort of toughing it out and saying all right let's let's really look at this and say okay maybe I was wrong about that kind of thing maybe I do need to look at this again then you feel like you it you feel like you are growing like you are really learning you are actually challenging yourself it it's like it becomes like you know like going to the gym sucks. But you do it, and it's boring, and you keep doing it. And you, but eventually, if you do it long enough, you start to want to do it. You start to miss it if you're not doing it. You start to feel at least a little bad if you're not doing it. And sometimes, I dare say, you might even feel a certain degree of self-satisfaction if you manage to keep at it for a while and get some results. And so it's kind of the same thing. You just keep plugging away, and eventually, you know, you want to read more, and you want to get that other book in and, and think about it more. And then eventually you want to see, can I do this myself? You know, by the time I was working on my on this book, I'd already published a bunch of books. I knew I could write books, but I was like, well, you can write this artistic stuff, but anything with a really rigorous academic start, I'm like, yes, I'll show you, I'll show you, I can write something rigorous. And so, uh, so that was kind of that was kind of it. But be, once you get past that level, you actually find there's like I'm learning, I'm understanding things, I actually can figure stuff out, and you know. It's not like you put this out there and say this will rule for all time as the definitive book. It's like this is my shot at a definition and an explanation. I put this out there with the expectations that it's going to get shot full of arrows and and uh, and so forth. But you've got to try. You've got to put these things out there and and try to define something, try to explain something, or else we're just left sort of sitting around not with nothing to say. Like what do we do? It's like you you've got to take a chance. You know, even a scientist with a lot of evidence, if someone comes along with a better theory, you have to accept it. You have to say, well, I'm not and it's just like, well, I did my best, and I guess I was wrong, and and you move on, and that's how that's how that's the the discipline. And so, um, you know, I'm prepared to take to take whatever flack I get for my generalizations, because I mean, any generalization will have problems. Sure. So, um, but uh, just one, I felt like. Yeah, there was something ultimately personal um, there, a personal gratification that I got for doing this. That was kind of like what happens when you write artistically or you write a novel, you know, sort of like when I wrote my, I know I'm talking a lot, but um, just briefly, when I wrote my first novel, I was not in the best place personally. And I wrote the novel and I wrote it through and I wrote the end and it was done. And I said, well, whether it gets published or whatever happens, Ever since I was a kid, I've been saying to myself, more or less, I'm going to write a book, and I did it. I wrote it. I did it. So whether it sucks or it's bad or good, I did it. 
and that is the notch on my belt or whatever. That's the badge, and you can't take that away from me. Nobody can take that from me. I did what I said I was going to do, and exactly, and like, you know what I mean, and it's the same thing with the scholarly stuff. It's like, you know, one of these days, I'll, I'm going to do something like that, and I did it, and I didn't half-ass it, and I, I did the time, and I did it as best as I could, and so whether it lives or dies or gets awards or whatever i know i did it and i can and that's not something that anybody can, can could give me i had to do it and it's not something anyone can take away from me that's, that's i did it that's fantastic and don't worry about talking too much that's what we want okay. we want you to talk so. <laughs> okay sorry <laughs> don't hold back. Yeah, that's fantastic but but i mean michael you know um i we've talked about this on previous page chewing with other guests and uh, hmm. Steve and our other co host Taylor, we've talked about this a lot kind of off camera. Like, you know, when it comes to writing and being an author, you know, part of it, um, I believe it was the last time we spoke about it on camera was with Philip Chase, uh, okay. who was brilliant, Dr. Dr. Chase, brilliant academic and writer, seems to be published, uh, fantasy writer. That, you know, we're kind of perhaps consciously or, or subconsciously seeking this, this bit of immortality with, with what we write <laughs> because it's, it's potentially going to. You know transcend our lifetimes and you know mm -hmm. if it stays in print and you know we will see, keep reading it then then definitely right um when when you're doing something really really rigid as you said and and, and you know more scholastic academic uh, and something that now is potentially an award-winning um you know it's going to be looked at as a as potentially a resource and could be yeah. looked at as a, as a resource in in the academic side so Essentially, you know, some professor could teach a, a course on X at the university level and use your book as part of the, the I know it's scary, isn't it? As part of the reference material. Yeah. It's scary, but it's exciting. Yeah. yeah. But, and, and that's different from, you know, someone making a movie adaptation about one of your, your, your fiction books, but it's still equally uh, weighty and important and impressive and significant. And so, you know, like, when you think about so going back to this whole this whole uh, academic stuff so yeah so imagine now your your book now stoker nominated book uh winds up being you know course course resource material for some university course on some aspect of horror or literature or whatever so mm -hmm. now um you know you, you might potentially have like you know your book sitting in in light well i know there's very very few physical libraries left on on the on the academic side there's there's still some but you know this now you're having Having students buy your book, you know, it's part of the mandatory required reading for for X course, and you know now people are referring to your book and and quoting it and blah blah. Like that's that's a different feeling too, isn't it? Like that's that's something really special too that people are using your book to learn. Mm -hmm, like, mm -hmm. Yeah, the uh, that, then you feel like you've intervened in the conversation that you've you've managed to make a contribution to that. And the goal there is is not to dominate the conversation, but to stimulate it and add to it and be a, and provide for others to draw from, um, and so that uh, so they can carry it forward. Um, so yeah, that would I mean that's the dream, right? That you're going to write something that will make that kind of impression, um, you know. And but also you could be you know like this book had something to do with other books that had been written before on the subject that I didn't like very much, and so. Um, that maybe someone takes a dislike to my book and writes something that counters it. But even then, I've been part of it. And so even if I got everything horrifically wrong and somebody had to come on and laboriously correct all my lame arguments, nevertheless, that still contributed something. And so uh, it's still worth doing. Um, it's not as flattering, but it's, uh, but it's still worth doing. Um, uh, hopefully I'm not a complete blockhead, and some of this stuff is actually of some use. Um, but yeah, that's that's the goal. It's like to to sustain something and carry it forward. There's a lot of um, worry now that interest in the humanities is shrinking, uh, that fewer people are signing up for English majors. And my th understanding is that people are largely doing this for reasons that aren't inherent to... It's not like people have lost interest in the subject. It's more like they don't see how they can connect it to, to the work that they need so that they can afford to live in this country. And uh, that's something that's put beyond the parameters of the discipline to address. But um, the it is important, I think, to keep the uh, 
keep the discipline alive, to keep interest in, in critical work alive. I mean, we a lot of us just do it spontaneously on the web or whatever, talk, talking about the books you love, talking about the movies you love, analyzing them, people who aren't paid a dime, who just want to talk about their favorite books and movies. So it's, it's an instinct people have, people want to do it. And uh, people may even want to study it in a more strictly structured or systematic way. And so there is an appetite for that. So it's important not to give up uh, and not to cede ground and, and to say, no, this does matter and we do need to study it and thinking about it does uh, help us uh, in important ways and it is it does have value. So uh, you are contributing in a particular way, but you're also contributing in a more general way to, to, to keep the conversation alive. Um, I don't know if my book is a huge part of that or any part of that, but I mean the goal is to do something like that. And, mm. uh, our friend Nicholas Kaufman is here. Oh. Hi, Nick. I'm a big fan of Michael Sisko's work, and also of Michael himself. My question is: Are there any short story writers in horror or fantasy that you'd recommend that readers may not know of? Gee. Um, in horror or fantasy, I just discovered this person. I don't know. Maybe everybody knows her, but uh, her name is Zena Henderson. Z-E-N-N-A. Last name Henderson. And she wrote in the 50s and 60s. One of the first important uh, female writers. She was of the Tip Tree generation. She was around there. Uh, I just blundered across a book of hers by complete chance. It was called The Anything Box. And um, it was just a collection of short stories. I, I found it online for free. It may be out of pot, copyright, or maybe I just got it somewhere. I shouldn't have got it. But, I mean, I, I wasn't consciously pirating it or anything. It was just there. But um, she was originally from Arizona. She was born in 1917 and died in the 80s sometime. Mm -hmm. And she, there's one story in particular she wrote called Walking Aunt Dade. D, Walking Aunt, A-U-N-T, Dade, D-A-I-D. And it's pretty clear that Aunt Dade, isn't, that's not her name. That's just an American parochial way of saying that maybe Aunt Dade is Dade, like she's a Dade person. <laughs> uh, uh, so, and that book is that story was was not like any you know you're reading it and you're thinking oh it's going to go like this and it doesn't it goes like that and and um, it's um, it was a really moving interesting story and I was actually thinking of maybe like reading it for YouTube or something like that because I've I've never heard anybody mention her uh, maybe other people have. But um, that was, I don't know if it's in print anymore, I doubt it, but um, um, Zena Henderson is the name, and uh, Z-E-N-N-A, and last name Henderson. Um, she wrote sci-fi stuff, too. There's one, um, I think one collection she did is just called The People. She did a whole bunch of stories about aliens who are just called The People. Um, there's like a TV movie made with like William Shatner in it about one of them, um, adapting at least one of her stories. So, I mean, people are not totally unaware, but she might have slipped through the cracks. I just haven't heard her listen. I haven't heard anybody mention her recently. So, I mean, that it's not a bad pull uh, to grab for, for her stuff. And then, you know, looking outside of um, the domain of, of English, looking at stuff translated from other languages. I mean, you know, there's just a host of amazing stuff you can read. In the horror vein, um, I don't know if, if people are reading um, Edogawa Rampo. He was a Japanese writer. His name is a pseudonym. It's just a, and it, it's like a Japanese version of the name Edgar Allan Poe, Edogawa Rampo, uh, but it's spelled like E D O. I wish I had a chat, I could type it there. E D O G A W A, and then the last name R A M P O. I'm pretty yeah. sure he's in print. He did a kind of famous story called The Human Chair. Um, done a few other stories as well that are also really uh, arresting and intense and original. And, uh, you know, and it's always interesting to see how writers from other cultures come into horror or come into weird fiction. With their own preoccupations and it, it really it can be very refreshing and very exciting to discover other writers um look i never know what to do with tutola like amos tutola you know my life in the bush of ghosts the palm wine drunkard because uh that i think is more magical realist so i don't know if i would call it horror 
short story writers and horror fans. Well, um, I mean, I guess he's well known now because he got a Stoker nomination. But Attila Veres, a Hungarian writer, did the book called The Black Maybe. It was published by Valancourt, um, and that was that was great. Like all the stories were really, really good, and there were some stories in there that were just outstanding. Um, I could probably go on longer. I mean, I'm thinking of. Um, I mean, people are reading Mariana Enriquez. I know that, and she has a new book out that I'm dying to read. I think it's Our Share of Night. I think it's called Our Share of Night. I'm dying to read that. I mean, I'll probably think of five other good answers in about about five minutes after we're done here is what will happen. Is and those ideas will come in there. But uh, I did just happen to blunder across Zena Henderson, so you might like look her up. Or maybe I'm just, maybe you know her already. Um, yeah, give her a shot. Uh, Walking Aunt Dade. That's, that story is really something, I think, in my opinion. No, that's good stuff. And you have a book available for pre-order now, right? Pray? No. On your website? Pest. Pest. Sorry. Pest. Um, yep, this is up for pre-order. This will be out in this will be out in a couple of weeks, probably. I think it's out this month. Um, so yeah, it's coming out from the, the great folks at Clash Books. They've been doing a lot of really interesting stuff lately. They've been publishing a lot of really good writers, and I'm I, I'm feeling very. Uh, this is my first book with them, and I've enjoyed working with them a lot. This feels like it, it could be quite a good fit. So yeah, that's coming out in a couple of weeks from now. Um, so I th yeah, I guess it's available. Uh, it is available for free order. So uh, add it to Goodreads. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I g indeed. Yeah, and just uh, added it. Fair is oh. here to help us out. Best on March thank 21st. You, yeah, thank you, Farah. Yeah. And um, what is what's the inspiration for Pest? What's the what's the uh, what's the the tagline or what's the, the pitch for it? Oh, the pitch or the tagline? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, again, pretty damn weird. I mean, it's set in our world, uh, so it's not in a fantasy world. Um, it combines a lot of the different preoccupations that I had uh, at the time a few years ago. And, you know, ever since I was a kid, I mean, I remember when I encountered Watership Down and that just absolutely, you know, kicked the legs right out from under me. I just, I didn't, never got over reading that book. And uh, I did a, sh a novella about birds called Ethics a couple of years ago with Lovecraft Easy and Press published it. And it was the first thing I'd written with no human characters, just all animals. And it, Watership Down was back here the whole time, breathing down my neck. And there was just something about writing about animals um, that is, I don't know, it, it, I, it ina I don't know about it, how it is for other people. For me, it, it enables me to get to the emotional core of things in a way that seems very direct. Um, and so part that was sort of in the background. Like I knew I wasn't done with that idea yet. I just didn't know quite how to make it work, and but I don't know if I can explain how I got this idea. But I mean, the story. Let me see if I can explain it in a minimally baffling way. The um, the main character is probably looking back on his. The idea, the main idea, was a main a person looking back on their life, more or less having reincarnated as a wild Himalayan yak. So I'm a yak now, but I used to be a human, and I'm looking back. Now we can finesse that a bit and say, well, it could be a dream of the human being. He's just, you know, it's a dream that he's been, you know, maybe he's ill or he's been knocked unconscious. That's what we see at the beginning of the story. He is knocked unconscious, so is he dreaming this or whatever? It doesn't matter. The point is the story bilocates between this person's life and their life as a wild yak in the Himalayas with the rut looming over them. Uh, the rut is coming. And there, and he can feel it coming, and he doesn't know what's going to happen, and because because he's a fully adult yak, um, why a yak? I don't know. Just it's a yak. It's, it's fun to say yak. I don't know. Uh, it's, I guess you could say there's an absurdism to it, but um, in his life, life in his human life, he's um, he's been recruited by this kind of Californian surfer sort of cult leader type guy to 
design and build a campus on Catalina Island. He's, uh, he's not an architect, he's a civic engineer, but he's had dreams of doing architecture, and this is his chance, this is his shot, to design buildings and design a whole, a whole campus. And he's going to get to do it. And the, this guy wants it built because he says that the, the Earth is going to be visited by a very special guest. And that guest is going to come to Catalina Island. He's seen it in his mind. He knows it's going to happen. And he wants a, a, a group ready to receive this guest when they come. And the campus is for them to go and prepare themselves. So, and uh, he's sketching. A lot of the book is about getting money, about getting the money for this. And this sort of magical duel that the cultists have with the bankers. And doesn't we kind of see which ones are the more weird, inhuman, and indoctrinated, and they both are like talking cross-talk to each other as they're basically trying to negotiate a loan so that they can actually get the money to build this thing. So that's what's going on in that life, and then, but then we alternate with, you know, um, you know, being a yak, and um, just yakking out in the, in the Himalayas and experiencing life from that point of view. So each you know i guess it, talking about the absurd like going into the animal perspective and looking back on mankind gives you a chance to sort of see the absurdity of all that being a yak is also somehow slightly comical to us humans i guess so it kind of works the other way um and i guess that was kind of the idea like usually if i'm writing i want the ideas to lead me to where they want to go uh, i want them to tell them i want to feel like i'm dealing with something that's alive and that has its own Destiny, like it wants, like it, you know, like I don't want a robot. I don't want to just grid out exactly what it's going to do. I want it to tell me what it wants to do, mm -hmm. and so then I kind of follow it where it goes. And then if it goes in a direction that's kind of lame, then I'll be like, eh, maybe we try a different direction. Uh, but at the same, I want to feel like sometimes yeah, I'll try to push a book in a given direction, and it's like, no, not doing it. I'm like, I'm the writer. You have to, mm -mm. nope. You can write whatever you want, man. It's going to suck. It's going to suck if you go this way. I'm telling you. And the book is right. And then you learn to listen to the book. And you're like, okay, fine. You were right. This part doesn't work. Trash it. I got to go this way because this is the this is what you want to be. Okay. So, yeah. And so with, with this, the idea is, you know, why, why try to force it into something that makes sense? It's like let it make its own sense. And then you'll have made something that's more new more different um something that's its own thing so that's where a book like like past kind of comes from and you know just like following out the the implications of some of your less transparent or obvious ideas and, and juxtapositions and just saying okay well what if what if we what if we do this what if we do that so i guess you could say in that sense it's experimental if uh it's it's not very experimentally written that's like it's not like it's all laid out weirdly on the page or anything uh, you know, it just looks like regular text, you know, so it's not all numbers and backwards and it's not like House of Leaves. You got to flip around. Yeah. Um, all you have to do is just sort of keep the strains, the two threads t clear in your mind and you can pretty much follow it, I think. Hmm. So let's see, that's the best I can do uh, to answer that one. So I'm getting the sense, um, Michael, you, so, and this is a very, I know it's become very staid, and, but Panzer, Plotter for your fiction stuff. So, <laughs> where, where where do you lean? I always know where it's going to end. I always know the ending. I know where we're going to land. And very often, the the idea of the book will often have to do with the ending. Like, what if we got there? And it's like, oh man, if I could get people there, then man, you know, they just they come away just ringing and smarting and and vibrating. And it's like, okay, how do I get there? And where do I start? And how do I get there? Um, and then. To a certain extent, I'll know like milestones. I'll know like important moments and things that need to happen. Um, but I don't rigorously plot things out. It's more like I know I'm going to have to go here, and then I'm going to have to go here, and then I have to go here. So it's more like an itinerary. Like you're going on a trip, and you know you're going to these places. You haven't been there yet. You don't know what it's going to be like. You're going to go there and look around and explore. So you know roughly what it's going to be like, like it's a cathedral, it's a stone circle, it's a cave, it's a zoo, whatever. But you don't know what experiences you're going to have when you get there. So the, the key is to kind of set up this series of excursions, these little trips. And it's like, now I go here, and what do you see? It's like, oh, I see this, and this, is, and I don't know what I'm going to see till I see it. 
And then sometimes that'll spin off into something else and it'll develop kind of organically. And that's what, what you want. So it's like not like no, no planning, total, totally spontaneous or pantsy flying. Um, there's a rough overall sketch, but I don't, sometimes I'll, I'll stop and say, okay, I need to go here, here, and here. I need to do this, this, and this. These things have to happen. So I'll have like little micro, micro outlining segments like for, you know what I mean? Not for the whole text, but just for this bit or that bit or how it's going to, how we're going to get from here to there. But I don't want to have, I just feel like if I'm going to do a really systematic overall outline, if I write that, why not just give people that? You know, it's like, it's, we're done. Here it is. Read that. I mean, you can just fill in the gaps with more interesting stuff than I could imagine anyway. So just do it. And that's cool. You know, like, why not? So I, I, I want to find out things about the book as I go along. But at the same time, I don't want it to be something that, that loses a reader's attention because they just feel like you're just kind of bullshitting. You know, like you're just kind of like, you know, just running your mouth. Like you want to... You want them always to feel like they're being taken to a particular place. And so that's why, for me, it's like the, the, the ending seems to work like such an anchor point. Like, I, wherever we're going, you know that's where we're going to end up. And so, you know, when I, used to, when I started out writing, I would start at the beginning and write straight through to the end. And I tend to do that now, now too. But as time has gone on, gone by, I've gotten a lot more comfortable with going with just ranging through the whole text, just going through the whole text and just like making adjustments here and here and here. It's like tweak this or this comes out or put this here and I can hold the whole thing together. And that's not that's not a challenge. It's not tough. And I can start to just kind of process the whole thing at once instead of a piece at a time. Um, I don't know if that's good or bad, but that's just more how it's become. And like I'm writing something now, and I've made, I've, it's short. It's, it's like only about fifty-five thousand words. But I've, I've gone through it and gone through it and gone through it and gone through it, and just like every time I go through it, it's just like the focus tightens just a bit more. The image or the idea gets a little bit sharper, a little bit clearer. I'm starting to say, that's what happened. That's what happened. That's why he's always sad, or that's why that's the way that that happened. So I have to go back and put it in. It's like, but the thing is, I'm not sticking in something that wasn't there. It's just, it was back here, but it wasn't on the page. And so I need to, it's like, put it on the page now. It's like, now, like, um, first book I wrote, I said, the manuscript, uh, Ligotti saw the manuscript, and uh, he didn't give me a lot of concrete feedback. He already understood that wouldn't work. Um, but he said, like, uh, he just, he said in certain places, it's clear, you know, what's going on, but the reader needs to know what's going on. And that was my feeling ever since pretty much. It's like, okay, am I make I know what's happening, but have I, does the reader really see what it is? You know, sometimes I'll feel like, you know, oh, I can't say that. And then I'll have to say, you need to say that. Of course you need to say that. Say that. That's what happened. This person did this. This person is a survivor of that. And then you, you put it in there. It's like, why didn't I? That should have been in there from the start. Why didn't I think of that? And it's because I was taking it for granted. And I, that was, it was sort of like I was living with this idea so much. I just was sort of taking it for granted that I that it was just there already. And it's like, no, you need to... They don't... Other people are reading this. You have to tell them. And then it's, oh, right. And then it's, then, then that's, a, and so, yeah, uh, I'm starting to figure out with each pass, you know, just like the focus gets pulled a little sharper. The idea comes out a bit more and I'm like, there it is. That's what it is. And then I can give it its proper place in the book and the book will kind of gel. And then I got it. Or as best as I'm going to be able to get it, that's it. So that's part of the, that's that's it. I guess it's because it, whether it's pants seed or plotting, I have to be engaged fully in this process of figuring it out, and I have to be like into it and enjoying it and thinking about it and turning it this way and that, or else I just feel like I'm phoning it in, and that's just not a good feeling. I don't want to ever feel like I'm just just like just d tossing something off. I want to feel like I'm really doing something, like I'm I've got. I'm carrying some weight. I've got some umph. I'm getting, I'm moving something, and uh, that's what gives me that feeling. Just I need to know that I'm I'm in, 
kind of into it and enjoying that pro that process of shaping, composing, and that that's where the work is and that's where the gratification is. Long-winded answer. But that's the answer. That was a great answer. Great, answer. great answer. Um, get that echo again. Oh. <laughs> okay. No, 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 no. <laughs> okay. Um, so obviously, <laughs> obviously, with with nonfiction, it's different. So um, a lot. And when I said, you know, the state question, serious question, because especially it applies on the on the nonfiction, and then you're you're doing research. There is a lot more planning going yes. on, right? So uh, uh, you know, a lot less liberty to do certain things. And right. um, you know, now. And remember, I talked a bit before about the, the the enjoyment you can get from both from writing fiction versus. I've never written nonfiction. I don't think I could. I don't think I have the discipline and and you know the the, the you never the, know the, the wherewithal, the fortitude <laughs> to do that. But um, I am very much a planner with my fiction, right? Mm -hmm. So I you know plan out a seven book series, planned out two prequel trilogies before that, planned out a subsequent seven book series, like planned out all the taught titles, planned out all the covers. Planned out all the exact plots, like everything planned down to the, the minutia, right? But mm -hmm. you know, I still do leave myself some latitude for okay, if if some character just you know initially you know they start off as being minor, but then somehow they just grab you and they're like, I need more agency and I need you to write more about me, and they they take a bigger uh, aspect of the book, like that happens. However, when it mm -hmm. comes to uh, nonfiction, obviously, typically mm -hmm. that's not something you're allowed to do. So. When you plan a nonfiction, because there's the research part, and then uh, it sounds like your book again is exploring, you know, uh, the work of others as well, and making some comparisons, contrasting things like that. Um, do you feel that it's when you can we talked about rigidity? Do you feel it's it's tougher to to do some of that because you are so constricted with some of this some of that stuff? Well, yeah, like. Um... For a long time, there was a palpable wrench every time I would shift into something more like nonfiction, and it was really, and it hurt sometimes. It would be really feeling like I was being pulled in two different directions because it seems like it is a totally different way of thinking. Um, that you know, there you feel not necessarily less free but everything you're doing is going to be you, you're sort of assuming everything you're doing every word you're saying is going to be very very closely examined and judged and uh you don't want to screw that up and you know it, it's hard to find your voice as a scholar as a writer if you have talent your voice just kind of presents itself but to have a voice as a scholar means you're making a certain claim you're claiming that you know what you're talking about and not just like the guy at the bar but like no i can that's scary I, stuff man that's scary stuff it's very <laughs> scary you know it's like that it's like i have to put myself out in front of people like some kind of pro that i know what i'm talking about so best not miss when you do something like that you want to make sure you know your stuff and just there's nothing more important than having that deep grounding in just a thorough familiarity with a body of writing or or something like that so like you know what it's like when you're on your turf when you're talking about say horror novels or whatever it is or fantasy novels you know your turf you know that stuff you know it and you feel very confident and so that's where you build from i think you build from that you say look i know this so then i can bring that out i can build out on that if i can know this i can know other things and also, you can give yourself permission to take chances in the sense that you're, okay, I'm going to put myself out there. I'm going to say, this genre works like this. And if I get killed, I die. But at least I, I took my shot at it. So the rigor, you, but that's the thing. It's, it really is sort of like what, what happened with writing. And eventually, you have to get to a point where you're in, in like getting something out of the rigor, that you're enjoying it or you're engaged in it. Like... Um, a lot of it for me was just like looking at what other people were saying and coming up with really clear explanations as to why I thought they were wrong. Um, and, well, if I'm going to shoot my mouth off and say they're wrong, then I better have an alternative. I can't just sit there and, and, and take pot shots at people. I have to put, present something positive with the understanding that I will in turn be found inevitably wrong in some ways. But it's, that doesn't matter. It's, so don't sweat that too much. 
you make it as strong as you can, but you don't become paralyzed. So it was about a just you, you read and process a lot, and you accumulate ideas, and you start aligning the ideas, and 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 uh, consistency here is your is difficult, but it's also your friend because you'll you can tell what fits, what doesn't, and but then in the midst of that, you have to invent something. You actually do have to do something creative. I have to come up with a definition. I have to come up with concepts. I have to explain what I mean when I'd say the supernatural. I mean this. Um, uh, this really grew out of reading fantasy and science fiction and, and horror, too. Like, well, what is the supernatural? This question. And it's like, okay, well, you know, it's ghosts and vampires and stuff. It's like, those are examples. That's not a definition. We can say these are all in the supernatural box, but what that box is has yet to be explained. What is that box? Well, it's outside nature. Okay, what does that mean? And then we can start to, but see, now we're thinking. Now we're trying to come up with something. Now we're trying to create something. Something other people could use. Or argue about. I mean, arguing about it is using it, so then it's on us. you can use it. Um, and, you know, like, what do I read weird fiction for? What do I want? What is the aesthetic gratification that I personally get? Uh, is that a feature? Is that part of it? Is that the intention? Is that, how is that made? So this, inform, this can help inform my writing in a very backwards, offhand way, you know, where you start to see what makes it what it is. So, you know, for me, the idea was the supernatural was less about some kind of, like if you're saying, okay, there are these gods and they create this and then the magic and their names are the magic. Now you're writing fantasy to me. Now you're creating, if it has rules, now we're in fantasy. Um, uh, or if you're saying, well, it's it's God and angels, well, now you're that's theology, right? That's a religious text. You now you're writing Dante. That's not weird fiction. Weird fiction doesn't know what the hell the supernatural is, and that's the point. It's that that's the feeling. Like, okay, where have I encountered the supernatural in my life, if I have ever? And it's been reading weird fiction. That's where I got my idea from. I didn't see ghosts. I read ghost stories, and that to me is what the supernatural is. Okay, what's that? And it's the feeling of not knowing what's real. It's when I'm sitting at home in my ordinary life, and I'm not in Middle Earth or any. I'm on Earth with you, and everything's normal. But I don't know. Suddenly, I'm like, how do I know what I know? How do I know that those people I see on the street are actually there? Or I'm seeing things. How do I know I'm me? And those little insidious questions it's like that to me is more supernatural than a ghost is a form of energy that comes from like that's science fiction that's that's great you want to write that but that's sci-fi that's for scratching a different itch it's a good itch it's a good scratch but that's not the, the itch i'm talking about the itch i want is that don't know kind of thing that kind of i don't, I don't know and it, that makes and then that to me is like when you start to feel like like weird fiction like the argument of the book it's like, what's the appeal of weird fiction? Is it that I want to be afraid? I want to be afraid I'll go on a roller coaster. That makes me afraid. Reading about atrocities in history, that makes me plenty afraid. Uh, watching the news makes me real afraid, but it's not, not like weird fiction. Weird fiction doesn't make me afraid that way. So what is it doing? And so often it's about, it's set in like super normal circumstances where everything's really normal. And it's a little too normal, and it's starting to feel oppressively normal, and and then something weird happens, and you gravitate towards that. It's like, wait, there's more. It's not all just this box. There's something, really. There's something above and beyond. There's something outside. Even if it's scary, there's an outside. And if there's an outside, then I'm not trapped anymore. And then there's there's a little there's an opportunity for freedom, however scary it is. So it's like, why do you go into the haunted house? It's like, that's a haunted house. It's full of ghosts that drive you crazy. It's like, oh, really? Let's go in. It's like, <laughs> right? You plainly want this. So it's like, well, what do you want? You, you want to, to know that they're not just, that everything hasn't actually been explained and planned and plotted out, that there's some something alive in there. And that to me is, is really what the, the, what the supernatural is about. So it, I had to go into what I liked about weird fiction in order to figure that out. But then once, then you just take that insight or that idea, whatever, and you can apply it artistically in a story, but you can also kind of codify it and make it academic. So you can, and you don't want the writing about literature to be so totally divorced from writing or literature or creativity. Otherwise it's like, 
then we're kind of not doing it anymore. Because uh, this is, it's still writing. It's still creative. It's creative in a different way, but it's still creative. Um, so the the key was finding a way to be creative in a kind of rigorous way where, you know, people could actually try to apply your concepts to other things. Um, and it also meant, like, the the theoretical part of the book is done within about, I mean, I'm looking it up. Like, this is the theoretical part of the book, this part. And this is the case studies, this part. This is the stuff where I get to talk about all my favorite stories. So you see what I did there, right? So I got to put the hard stuff in here, and then I got to have the fun back here. So here I get to talk about, you know, Poe and Tanana Reevedu and uh, Edith Wharton and, you know, all kinds of great stories that I like. And and I apply the thought, the, the theory from this part gets applied in this part. And the idea that I can see if it works or not. So I kind of... Um, I, I smuggled some enjoyment into the into the book um, uh, too. So you know, it it was it was hard to write. It took a long time. It was there was a lot of paring away stuff that didn't matter and focusing and repurposing and you know. Uh, but uh, it's not like I'm going to whip out another one of these next year. It's something like that. It's but there is something gratifying about a long term project that you can actually finish. Like. This took years and years, and then it's done, and it's actually done. I didn't just quit. It's done, and I did it, and it took a long time, but I was able to sustain effort over that period of time, and so I got something that's like rock solid, in my opinion, all the way through. And so, you know, that, that so, it, you know, it, it sustains itself after a while, just because uh, you, you've invested so much in it. <clears throat> We did have a question from Ali. A question from okay. Francisco. Uh, where would you recommend someone start with your work? It uh, kind of depends. Thank you, Ali. Uh, it sort of depends on where you're, what you want. Um, if you're more on the fantasy angle, um, the narrator is uh, a book people seem to like. Um, that is, um, you know, I, I don't have a seven-part fantasy trilogy or series. But I w I've always been fascinated by the idea of fantasy worlds and, and world building. And I wanted to come up to world building in a way that didn't involve being God. Like, instead of knowing everything and seeing everything, I was saying, no, everything's local and everybody disagrees about everything. So the world started here. No, it didn't. It started here. Well, we said, I was like, no, this is the gods. No, these are the gods. No, that war didn't mean that. It meant this. It's like, no, those were the good guys. What are you talking about? Those guys were evil. No, those guys were evil. So there's no, it's just like humans, in other words, right? It's a mess, right? It's just the history is contradictory and messy. And that, you know, if, that, of course, gives you leeway to contradict yourself, which is, which is fun. I think that's like, you know, the Viraconium books by, by M. John Harrison, um, in Viraconium and so forth. They take kind of, they take kind of that approach. Like every version of the story is like a revision of this place that exists sort of despite its constant revisions. Um, so the narrator is kind of a, a fantasy book. I've written several fantasy books in that world and I've decided certain things about that world and other things I'm letting the characters disagree about. Um, but so that's, but you don't need to know any background or anything to understand the narrator. It's a self-contained book. And that was, I wanted to do something that was like fantasy. I mean, it's more like Napoleonic than sword and sorcery, but fantasy war, but without the moral unambiguity of something like Tolkien's books, where there's good and evil, or Moorcock's law and chaos is more immoral, but they have clear, distinct sides. And, uh, and humans have a pretty clear path they have to negotiate between these two extremes. And he was like, well, what if you just have two guys, just like war, like, like an apocalypse now take on war, where it's just, it makes no sense, nobody makes any sense, it's all baffling, it's all just a horrific mess. And I was like, I, that's what I was sort of, maybe other writers have done that and I missed it, but I wanted to do that in a fantasy book, and that's where the narrator was coming from, just a total mess. Hmm. Um, well, I'm ripping off Stalker in that book, too, I have to admit, you know, sorry. Um... I can't help it. But um, if you're more interested in horror, 
then maybe the place to go might be Anti Societies, which is a collection of short stories that I did with Grim Scribe just a couple of years ago. Uh, probably already two years ago now, but um, that's like ten short stories, all sort of centered around the theme of isolation and loneliness. It was not planned to come out during COVID, but it did. Um, and uh, that's uh, that's uh, you know like the stories are all pretty much uniform. I wrote it kind of like I sort of thought I want to write something that would work kind of like a record album. We're old enough to remember those. Uh, okay. You know, you get a record, forty minutes. Each track's about five minutes, so you're looking about eight to ten tracks, and that's your record. And I wanted to do something like that with like each, like about ten stories, all about the same length, and it would just be like a themed record. Each so story would be just like one idea developed and played out uh, in a story of about 4,000 words a piece. So nothing too oppressively long. Um, I don't know why it occurred to me in that kind of formal way. It just did. And for some reason, that just made it really, really straightforward to write. Um, so that might be a good place to start with horror, especially because it's it's, it'll be in print and easier to find. Some of my stuff can be a little tricky to locate because it's out of print. Um, so yeah, that's where I would say you could start. Um, I don't have any horror novels that are still in print, I think. Um, yeah, so of the stuff that's out now, um, I mean, ethics is kind of horrific. That's around, but it's kind of its own thing. But um, yeah, so anti-societies for horror, I'd say, and the narrator for fantasy. And, uh, Aaron's here, who sounds like Grimdark, <laughs> the narrator. <laughs> Mm -hmm. and our friend, hey, Taylor's here. Hi Taylor. there. Yeah. Hey, Taylor. And uh, Birdie in the Books, uh, Tenevere, I'm mispronouncing that name, Do doesn't get enough exposure. I feel like she's fantastic. She is. Yeah, I did a story of hers in here. Um, oh, nice. Uh, I keep forgetting if it's Senora Muerte or Senorita Muerte. Um, let, me, let me check my table of contents. And I, can, I don't want to mangle the name of the story. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Where is the list? Where is the list? Um, I'll gun it. Where is it? There it is. Uh, Senora Suerte, rather. Senora Suerte is the story I did. Yeah, so Do is really good. I mean, she did... Um, she's done something, I think, pretty recently. And um, a couple of anthologies. I don't know if she's Caribbean. I, might, I could be totally wrong about this, and I apologize. Um, but... Um, yeah, I will. I will just heartily re re up the uh, that affirmation from from um, Birdie in the books. Uh, read Tanana Reeve Do. She's really really good. She's the real thing. She's an exciting writer, and she, she's still. Uh, and I think she's got more surprises for us. I think that she's going to keep growing and learning and doing more. Nice. And uh, Chris had a comment. I still haven't entirely shaken the existential crisis that one of the stories <laughs> in Anti Societies gave me. In a good way. <laughs> I mean, I'm very happy to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> I was, yeah, I'd be so curious what, to know which story, but um. yeah. I was uh, curious about that one. Isolation can be a very heavy, and uh, it's very it could be a very negative thing uh, for for us to experience. Did you do any? Um, research on that on those stories or was it something you drew from ex personal experiences or well i drew that from experience i drew that from experience uh, i mean i'm married and and uh, so i haven't been alone for a long time but there were periods in my life uh, that when i you know especially in my 20s when i was i just moved to new york and i knew a few people but you know i was busy they were busy and so you know there were times when i would go weeks without talking to anybody except like the person at the bodega or in the, in the laundromat you know just like uh, here's your change you know, or something like that, and so um, I mean, I've, 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 I know what uh, you know. When you're alone for a long time, you get stranger and stranger and stranger because you're you're not getting feedback or input. So your your world shrink your your world doesn't shrink, but it becomes very you flavored, and everything you see and experience is really a, it starts to reflect a bit more of you than you really needed to. But yeah, and always, I don't know why, but I've always been fascinated by, you know, this, the, I, so I wouldn't call this research, but it might count as research, um, writings by people, by insane people or people who've been called insane. 
just intrigued by their perspectives on things. Um, so I guess growing up in the 70s, I guess there was a kind of uh, something in the air that tended to romanticize insanity sometimes or delusions a little bit to say, uh, these are the people who, who really know what's going on. And I guess I absorbed a little bit of that for good or ill. Um, but um, I was always um, fascinated by um, accounts of, of, of madness, of people going mad, um, whether it's Poe pretending to go mad or being mad but pretending to go mad, but being mad, I don't know. But um, the, 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 the fact that sanity can be such an elusive thing you know, insanity is real easy to peg and define, but in, but sanity, like show me a, a sane person, that can be a tricky thing to do. Uh, it's like, you know, show me a mentally healthy person. Show me a person whose brain is balanced. If people's, if you're taking medication for a chemical imbalance in your brain, uh, well, show me a balanced brain. Like, what does that look like? If, if so, uh, you know, maybe that everybody has some, um, has to deal with reckon with this in some way and um so i mean reading those books reading people's accounts of their own experiences their own hallucinations their own delusions um you often see how normal a lot of their assumptions are that they're often what you're seeing is an exaggeration of what is actually a very normal ordinary thing or something that's a very common thing that they're not coming at something from absolute outside what they're doing is is basically misunderstanding or exaggerating something that we that you and i do and you say oh this is in me too and uh, okay what does that mean um so a lot of the stories I'm writing, you know, the characters are, some characters are insane. Like, you know, there's, there's some characters, you know, this is a person who's in a mental institution and for whatever purposes we're calling this an insane person. But, um, but the doctor's also insane. <laughs> <laughs> they're not obvious that they're insane, but by the end you should realize this is, no, this is, this, what is this? And that this need to analyze and understand insanity is, is in self, uh, there's something a little bit too insistent about it, a little bit too vehement about it. And then you start to say, wait a minute. Um, so yeah, exploring insanity um, is something that just never ceases to fascinate me and draw me in. Um, so, you know, and, and often I'll write about characters who are mentally troubled or uh, I wrote, I'm, somehow I just ended up writing about homeless characters a fair amount of the time. And um, I'm not sure why I do that, but I guess I just, their perspective is, in, is, is seems very important to me somehow. It's a very ready way to take you out of your everyday commute when there's someone sitting there who's like, whose experience of exactly the same circumstances that you find yourself in on a train or whatever. I live in New York, so I take the subway. And so you, you can see um, people dealing with this, you know, and, and pr trying to process this or just trying to handle this, these trains, this society, this crowd, this crush, this society, you know, or th these people who don't, who just see right through you and um, don't see you, you know, or don't, you know, or who, who have to shut your suffering out. Um, that's a, that's isolation in a crowd. I right? think like that's isolation in a big group of people. <clears throat> so, you know, I guess I got more and more interested in what separates people and and the way people can turtle up and close in and insist on being right. Like, I know how it is because this is my life and I planned it out and I plotted it and this is how it is and it has to be this way. And um, you're like, nope, oh, okay. Uh, like, it's, you feel a lot of people are kind of like that. They're real mellow until you get to this one thing and then suddenly those eyes get wild and you're like, wait a minute. That's over the, there's the line. I found it. There's the line with that person. And don't cross that one. Got it. And that's the moment when the person is kind of turns inward. And there's, now you're dealing with their isolated self. Hmm. And you get a gl glimpse of that and an interaction with that. And that's a very powerful place. There's a lot of power in isolation. That's the problem. Because hmm. when you're alone, you're always right. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, right. You're you're always right, and so it's like so you can be real strong when you're alone. But when you bring that out into public, then the the sparks start flying, especially when the other guy is just as isolated and weird as you, <laughs> and know you're both always right. So then th that's real interesting. And I think when you look at our politics today and what the internet does to people, you see a lot of people who are always right. And what happens when those people get together is, is, is very, I feel it's very, very familiar to looking to me after writing these stories. Yeah, you're always right when you're actually here. I like that. Uh, our friend Taylor um, has a comment. The internet adds a really interesting layer to this idea of having the world reflect back on parts of yourself. We all create echo chambers so naturally it takes a conscious effort not to. Yeah, I'm, I agree, absolutely. And like, yeah, uh, you see, you know, like I can just see sometimes you hear people talking or they give an opinion and you can just hear that's internet brain talking. And that internet brain is not good brain. It's not good. It's it's always a very shut in kind of isolated. And it's like you're not you're not hearing yourself speaking. That's the weird thing about the echo chamber is like you're only hearing yourself, but you're not hearing yourself hearing yourself. You're not actually oh, fully you're not hearing yourself like you have to say this out loud in front of another human being who's going to go. What did you just say? And then you're like, oh, yeah, I'm a human and I'm alive and I live in a bigger world. <coughs> the Internet is so good at simulating feedback mm -hmm. that you feel like you're saying something that's gotten reinforcement. But that's because he went out and looked for it and cherry picked it and and you you know you have like a focus group that just gives you back what you're saying I, she's exactly right and so yeah so that that you do actually have to make that conscious effort so it, it, it's weird because the the social media is actually actually isolating us in a social looking way but that isn't really social and you always have to say okay how does this sound on the street on the street how does this sound because i don't it sounds great behind my computer screen but on the street it doesn't work then the street level is always the your litmus test like you know how does it sound there because if if grandma doesn't like it and the guy at the laundromat doesn't like it then it's not gonna work so uh just remembering the street and that's that's how i do it is try to remember that and Aaron mentions also being alone is very different now in the in, in the world of social media. Yeah, I agree. It's um, um, you feel less alone, but you are more alone. <laughs> um, you know, you're not getting the you're not forming a social group. You know, like for a great example. Well, I don't know how great it is. It feels great to me, <laughs> but uh, you know, like. Cons on online cons just didn't work for me. They didn't work. I needed to be in the same place with those people. I needed to be physically there at the con with other folks. And it just had to do with being in a, being in an environment where I don't have to explain who I am. Not in the sense that I'm famous, but in the sense that I write weird stuff and everybody around you writes weird stuff or they write that and they, they get it. They understand. They know you're not George R.R. R. Martin. They know you're not. It's like, well, when's your movie happen? Like, no. They understand. They get it. They know what writing is like. They know what publishers are like. They know what editing is like. They've gone through the same crap. They've had to deal with bad editors or good editors. They've had these experiences and reviews and all of that. And so you don't have all of this sort of, I have to explain myself, that can just fall away and you can just be who you are with these people and they're who they are. And you vibe with them in ways that are like nurturing and you don't even see it happening. Just like talking about just regular everyday stuff like, you know, your bad back or whatever, or somebody's, you know, it's like, you hear, but you, did you read this? It's like, well, yeah, that's awesome. And you, or, you know, um, you know, like uh, when we get together at cons and new writers would come along. I mean, and at least in, at ReaderCon, I remember that we had a pretty nice horror community at ReaderCon. And, you know, if you showed up and you were doing horror, you sat with us. It's like, come have lunch with us. Come and sit down. It's like, come and sit down. You're writing horror, come sit down. We'll talk with you. It's like, did you know this? Do you know that? Did you read this person? Read that person? Uh, you should talk to so-and-so. Oh, you have a story about that. This person's doing an anthology. You know, you know, and then, <coughs> you know, that was networking, but it was also just, it was, uh, we didn't know we were building a community. We were just hanging out. And, but, you know, it just, it, we then we all noticed that it feels really good. And then you've got, like, backup. You've got people, you know, like, you've got people. And you've got to be people for them, but then they're people for you. And yeah. and that, 
you know, that makes you feel less alone in a way that's very concrete. So, I mean, the Internet's not, a, not the villain. It's a tool, and it depends on how you use it. I mean, you might have followed what happened with Laird Barron lately. Did you read about that? or mm -hmm. Laird Barron, the writer. So he got sick. And but they posted about it on social media, and like they raised, he's he's a writer, so he has no insurance. He's got nothing. So and people just like they chipped in, and he got like a hundred grand in twenty four hours on a GoStuff GoFund, and he was blown away. He didn't expect it. And you know who's giving it to him is people who met him at cons, people who talked to him, people who knew him. They were fans, but they were also just people who knew him. And in, and they they liked him, and they didn't want him to to die. So they. <laughs> contribute and so and you know you've got you've got people like there's a network now, and that was social media that made us aware of that you know if you put that in a newspaper or a magazine it wouldn't we, my money wouldn't reach him in time so it, you know it, it, he shouldn't have had to deal with that money issue he should have just had to deal with not the, the not dying part which luckily he successfully managed um, but you know that's an additional headache that, that we could take off his shoulders and so, you know, that's that's an important part of not being alone, and social media can help with that. But you got to ask yourself, is there anything at the bottom of it? Is there some sort of core connection that you're establishing, establishing with people? So, yeah, I mean, the, the you know, I, I've, I've learned so much from meeting other writers and other people at cons and other readers. Like, you know, Chris McLaren was just logging in and saying, I met him at a, met him at Reader Con and we talked and I figured all kinds of stuff out talking with him because he's read a lot. And I've given him manuscripts to read and said, what did you think? I think he read, I gave him a manuscript to pass to see what he thought of it. So, you know, yeah. and, uh, you know, writers, readers, people who've just read a lot, who can steer you towards stuff that may give you that spark of inspiration that you need. And that stuff, you just, you just don't quite, you just don't get it on social media. And, you know, social media has the sinister tendency, like Meta's really going, doubling down on this now in particular, like where you are supposed to be, like they want to replace you with a cartoon, I think, mm. like that Meta thing that they want to do. And it's like, I'm not a cartoon. <laughs> you know, I'm a person. Okay. You know, I have lines of worry gouged into my face. The cartoon doesn't have those. You need to see these these gray hairs here. And you have to see how they keep growing the more you ask me to do at this job, you know, so like you need to see the effects of what you're doing to me. And a goofy cartoon character isn't going to do that. It's like you don't get to turn me into a cartoon. And so, you know, that's that's my worry. The, the, people don't seem to want to do that. I think people are kind of waking up a bit more about the diff the downside, the unreality of social media. Um but yeah, this this thing about not about seeming being more alone, but not not knowing you're alone, yeah. is um, we are more alone. We are working from home. We do have fewer social ties. You know, it's not like grandpa going off to the club or bowling or whatever. Like you're just like you're here, and your friends are on other states, and you see each other very rarely, and we're all too busy, or everybody's working too much already anyway. And and if you're writing and working. You've got two jobs, and I guess if you're podcasting, then you've got a third job. <laughs> uh, and so, I, I, yeah, so I that's, a lot. Better, I <laughs> that's a lot, you know. So then, when's the 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 drift time? When do you just sort of sit and just like you sit in the boat and just like just you know you just watch the world and go by and just just hang with people? And when you do it, you realize how nourishing that can be, and that you actually do need it. And like, oh yeah, we're humans, and we do this, and we just sit and vibe, and it's a good thing, um, you know. So like, I was very—that was the thing. It was very easy for me to just like stick my head in the computer and leave it there, and just like not get out. And my wife is always after me. It's like get the, get out of that room, you know. <laughs> it's not a man cave. I'm not in here with cigars and beer. I'm sitting here like trying to work, and like you know, you have to like it's like you know you, you know. She just says we're we're all dead anyway, you know. So like going. <laughs> Go eat the pizza. You know, it's like it'll go do it. So there's that. And um, but social media, you put on a podcast. Not no, no offense to podcast listeners, but you put it on and you feel like you're not alone, right? Yeah. And you know, you are still alone. You just don't feel it as much. And the circumstances do make us more alone. And we do feel the need for other people. There's nothing. It's only human to want that. And so as I listen to podcasts all the time. I listen to all sorts of audio books and whatever. And, you know, but it, it's like, um, it can't, 
be the it can't substitute it can supplement and it can extend uh, but uh, you, you do actually have to go out in the street and you have to know your neighbor and you have to know that if you, someone's breaking into your house, they're not going to ignore it, <laughs> you know, or, or if you're in the street, you know, lying there face down, they're not just going to step over you on their way to do, on their way to, 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 you know, file a report online or whatever. So, you know, that, that is so essential. And, you know, man, it's closing, it, online only cons really just, just made that so very, very clear. Um, you know, get together with folks in person. It just, it really helps. <laughs> It really does, and that's coming from me. I'm an isolator, so. <laughs> yeah. uh, Chris, to comment. Okay, I that, talk that's back to, talk podcasts back to podcasts when I want to, mm -hmm. to add a point, add but a point, somehow it never turns into a discussion. discussion. Yeah, Chris, I would. I, you should get help, Chris. I'm saying, I'm just. If you're talking back to podcasts, you should get help. <laughs> and also, I uh, also noticed that you teach as well. I, uh, yes. Where, during your time teaching, what have you learned about yourself? <laughs> uh, I, I have much deeper wells of patience than I ever dreamed I could have. I have much more stamina than I thought I had. Hmm. Um, you know, if you told me beforehand what I was going to be doing in a day, I'd be like, no way. And uh, so I learned that about myself. There are other things you learn about yourself that aren't necessarily so nice, but then you work on those parts. Uh, you know, like, uh, it's like, don't challenge me. And it's like, well, you need to be challenged sometimes. If you're talking, if you're talking nonsense, then you need to be challenged. So, um, but yeah, I mean, what you learn, um, you know, I, like, I learned that I love my students. I don't, didn't expect that. Because, um, you know, it's not like, I mean, some of them are pretty rough around the edges really rough you know or they don't read and they don't but you know at the same time I, I just I'm in their corner and I want them to to succeed I want them to get out of whatever trouble they're in and into a better place and um, I've learned how hard that can be I've learned how how hard it can be when it doesn't work and you see people not work out and when you see people make it how important that can be you know, I was in school all my life. You know, I was getting a graduate degree. I, I always had teachers, and there were teachers who were crucially important to me. They're teachers I think about literally every day who helped me or who became friends. So many, and, you know, I don't know if I can be that for someone. I would like to be that for someone. Um, so what you learn about yourself, I'll give you an example. So Bartleby the Scrivener, you may know that story by um, Herman Melville. Um, you know, about a, a scrivener, he's a copyist, and this is 19th century, and he just refuses to work, and he gradually refuses to do more and more until he basically refuses to leave the office, or indeed, he's not violent, he's not disruptive, he just, you ask him to leave, and he says, I would prefer not to. You ask him to do work, and he says, I would prefer not to. And his employer is baffled and is somehow disarmed by this and is not able to just fire him and throw him out. He wants to reach him or contact him or help him or something. So I'm talking about this story. And, um, you know, I'm a Melville scholar. I've read Melville. Anyway, one of my students says, maybe he can't read. Read my prayer previous remarks, I'm a Melville scholar, I've read about it, and nobody ever came up with the idea that Bartleby couldn't read, and that his copying was just like, just like drawing, as opposed to actually understanding what he was copying. Maybe he can't read. And that taught me to shut the hell up and listen, because other people are going to see stuff in there that's really there that you didn't see. You know, it's like, that's a valid interpretation that I never saw. And that my expertise does not consist in knowing better than my students. It consists on having certain, being a bit more skillful at doing something we're all capable of. And my job is to challenge them and to guide them so that they can, to try to stimulate that and try to get that to happen. And then to translate it into academic language so that they can get good grades and do well in school. And because uh, I'm right, it's all introductory level stuff I teach. You know, I teach community college. In the South Bronx, you know, my students are coming in there because they want a job. 
they're not coming in there because they want to read Shakespeare. They will. You Well, no, they won't. But they'll pretend they will. They'll read a summary, and they'll talk about it. They'll be very interested in talking about it. Uh, and so, it's, and the ideas will engage them. And if you tell them, okay, Hamlet's father was killed by his own uncle, and then he married his, and they'll go, that's messed up. Uh, and then they'll be into it. You know, like that situation is dramatic, and they will get into it. You just have to, you know, get them past certain barriers like the 16th century language or whatever. But then they're prepared to talk about the ideas, and they have wonderful things to say. And so, yeah, just sort of. I hadn't. I didn't think I would relate to the students as much as I do. Hmm. Um, I wouldn't think I would have learned as much from them as I have. Because um, it's the sort of thing you say. So I learn from my students. Like no, I really learn from my students. I really learn a lot from my students. I feel like. I mean, again, it's a social thing. There is a connection that you establish. And when the circumstances force you to connect, create connections with people you wouldn't otherwise have talked to, you can learn a lot about just not even academic stuff, just like what the world is like, you know, the, the, the city I live in. I understand this city a lot better just because I have students who are from the Bronx, from, from you know, from, you know, and from other countries all over the world, you know, like African students, I got Middle Eastern students, students from all you know, Dominican students, students from all over Latin America, and I learn about the world via what they bring into the room. And so that I didn't expect. So I guess I learned the limits of my own understanding, <laughs> and the limits of my own uh, academic understanding um, from these students and. Um, I've learned things that I'll take through with me to for the rest of my life from them. Um, I'm proud of my students. I like my students. And, uh, speaking of teachers, our friend Taylor is a teacher too. Uh, something I've noticed as I got older is that silence is loud to me. I'm much more comfortable when some type of noise is in the background. Move to New York. <laughs> You'll do fine. You will do great. Yeah. Uh, no, I have, uh, Benjamin called it noise psychosis. Uh, it's like if there's any noise at all, I'm paying attention to that and not what's in front of me. So it's like I have to, I, you know, I really have to, like, barricade out the noise to be able to, to function. So, like, I write with earplugs. You know, I, I sleep with earplugs. I go through a lot of earplugs. Uh, that's living in New York. Um but yeah, silence. It's I know I crave silence. Frankly, I uh, I crave it. I yearn for it. Um, it would be it's I savor it whenever I get a chance to to have some. You know, just when sometimes at two in the morning the neighborhood quiets down and you can just sit there and just be quiet and it's very precious. But I, I understand that sometimes the silence can be oppressive uh, too. Um, the when the silence feels like absence. When it feels like something's lacking, when it feels like something's missing, then it's then it's painful and difficult, um, you know. But when it's an antidote to too much, then I'm down with the silence. More silence. <clears throat> I find that I'm craving silence. I think you know Taylor a bit of the opposite as I get older, and obviously I'm. You know, a lot oh yeah, older. yeah. And Taylor, I'm 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 craving. That silence, that solitude, and especially you talk about writing. Like, I have forced myself to write in all kinds of different uh, venues, but mm -hmm. I prefer to be, you know, in my writing space, which is essentially here. Um, and if there's, you know, TV's on or something, I, I can write beside my wife while she's watching TV or whatever, which I try to do because you want to be in the same room with her. And, but but I, I need headphones on most of the time. And, mm -hmm. and to, to, you know, maybe I'm playing a soundtrack or something inspiring but yeah but my best writing is is yeah, in my little corner here just at the desk and you know everything's quiet and maybe I'm, I'm, let's say i hear the birds chirping outside that's it like yeah. yeah just just silence and i i find it um really now nourishing to have those moments of silence because you don't realize how few moments you actually have where there's complete yeah. silence other than maybe sleeping um yeah you know like i yeah i'm I'm, I'm actually craving silence as I get older, so. 
It's precious for sure. <laughs> and, uh, Milo's uh, had a curious, what what's, what's something that your readers would be surprised to learn about you? Hmm. Surprised to learn about me. Um, hmm. Well, so I don't know what they know and what they don't know. Um, uh, surprised to learn about me. Um, I mean, I'm pretty, I'm pretty boring. I'm pretty much like, um, uh, well, in the sense, you know, I don't uh, like, I don't go off on weekends and uh, ski down mountains or anything. Um, I. Uh, I guess a lot of people don't understand, don't realize I'm from California, or they don't see me as a per like I'm from Los Angeles. Nobody under nobody sees me as a typical person from Los Angeles, but that's not a really interesting thing necessarily. I guess, um, well, I, I'm not as much of an athlete as I used to be, but I used to try to be reasonably athletic. I used to do Tai Chi every day, um, Chen style. Nick Mamatas, the writer, also does that. Uh, We've uh, we've sparred very slowly, on at least one occasion. Um, anything else? Um, I don't know. Um, let's see. No, I can't think of anything good. I'm sorry. Uh, there's probably a good answer to that that'll come to me later, but I can't think of anything that would that jumps to mind right now. I'm sorry to say. Um, what uh, what made you move from California all the way to New all the way to New York? School, school and work. Um, this is where they accepted me. So um, this is where I went. So you know, I, I went to did all my all my college education uh, was was here in in uh, New York State, uh, and then uh, I got it. You know, I got my degree at NYU, and then I had to find a teaching job, and I applied everywhere because teaching jobs even then were scarce so you know like beirut i'll go uh take sign me up you know cairo i'll go if i have to dodge bullets at least i'll be teaching but um in the end I, my teaching gig turned out to be here at ostos at, uh, at cuny which so it was in the city anyway i didn't have to leave uh and um so that they were the ones who, who took me so um it was kind of a choice in the sense that early on I'd applied my, more or less to East Coast schools just because I wanted to experience some, uh, another part of the world. I didn't want to just be in California the whole time. I love California, but um, I was just curious to see what life was like elsewhere, and it just the East Coast ended up being the place that grabbed me and, and kept uh, giving me a kept offering me opportunities to, to go to school and get jobs and things. So that's where I, how I ended up living here. Um, you know, the New York I knew as a kid, bearing in mind I'm old, is, uh, you know, this was like the New York of like the French Connection New York. Like this was, this was the Barney Miller, gritty, grungy, uh, broken um, taxi driver New York. That was my image of New York. You know, bubbling potholes and steam bubbling, pouring out of the ground and, and, uh, and uh, everybody's got a revolver. Um, so that wasn't quite the New York I moved to. You know, I, I moved I moved into the city in '95, um, so I've been here for a minute, and uh, but it was already transmogrifying into the uh, dystopia that it now is. But the uh, you know it was developing new flavors. Uh, but um, yeah, so that that was um, it was sort of destiny, I guess, that, that drew me to uh, to this side of the world. Good to see other parts. It's amazing how different just a state away can be. Just going from one state to another, how different it yeah. can be. Yeah, it's it's true. And then moving across the country, it was it's very very different. Very very different indeed. Um, the you there's in the West. I, I don't know where are you guys, Steve. Where are you? I'm in New Mexico. All right. Okay. And and I, I, PL is that what I, should I call you? Yeah, I'm in Canada. Well, yeah, <laughs> Ontario, Canada. So Windsor on the bonjour. Uh, We're from Detroit. Oh, I don't speak. Uh, okay, I well. think it, but yeah. No, I'm just uh, across the border from Detroit. So right, right, okay. So yeah, I mean, um, so I've only been to Canada a couple of times. Been to Toronto. Sorry, Toronto. I know it's pronounced. Uh, but the, um, the sixth. 
I know. It's like it's. If I just parenthetically, it was like it was so weird flying from New York. I was flew from LaGuardia, which at least they've re renovated it since. But at the time, it was sort of like a open air men's room. And then you fly into Toronto Airport, and it was like arrive. It's like a, it's like arriving at Starfleet or something. Like everything was amazing. Uh, it's like oh, this is what a nice airport looks like. Um, it was pretty nice there, yeah. I must, I must say. I must say. Yeah, compared to LaGuardia, it's heaven. Um, JFK, but yeah, is so a, like, JFK is a nice airport. I like JFK. JFK is nice. That's true. But I was flying out of LaGuardia, not so now it's better. But certainly in New Mexico, you know, you you've got room. Everybody's got room. There's so much room, and here you have no room. <laughs> you got people on top of you and all sides of you, underneath you, and they're just they're on you all the time. And so, but if you're from anywhere west of the Mississippi, you're used to being able to. You've got, you've got a yeah exactly. You've got your zone. Another if in the when you're in the east, you start to feel a little. People are up in your space just a little bit. You know, it's like it just feels like they don't have your your. You're used to just having people not quite here you know they're a bit further back or they're in their cars and you're in your car mm -hmm. everybody's in their box and, and you know so it can be it's very strange being in new york where everybody's just in your face but you know that's a, it's, a, it's such a drastic change uh i notice when i come back to california and visit because i come back my folks are in california and i'm always a little faster than everybody is i'm a little bit less patient than everybody is when I go to the store, it's like, you know, it's like we're, I'm moving down those aisles. I'm getting those groceries. I'm getting that stuff out of there. It's like, you know, check it through. Like, like, let's get that stuff bagged. Get it in the car. You know, it's like that sort of, I'm on the New York clock. Uh, and the California clock is much more, is a little bit, even, everything's different. Like traffic's different. It's still dense, but it's not, it's not bloodthirsty. It's just kind of there. And uh, it's just very different. And so, you know, I kind of, I kind of thematize that a bit in past. I kind of, um, the the cult leader is a kind of he's a very california kind of guy he's like the sort of linen wears all linen he's got a z bead right here surfs you know he talks dismissively about people in the east you know it's like well they don't have our sense of space like we have out here you know like we have, you know us westerners we have a better sense of space um so uh little cohen brothers he uh characterization there but um yeah, and like being on the East Coast feels like you're in an older place. It, it's weird because you know, like there have been Europeans in New Mexico and Mexico from and, and California, you know, under the King of Spain for a long time. But there's you know, Los Angeles is still a very young city, whereas you know New York is old. Like you know, um, and so you feel the history around you a bit more, and that's intriguing and interesting. That was part of the appeal, I think, is everything was so new in the in the west that i was curious to see what it was like to live in a place that was a bit older but still in the country so yeah very different very different indeed and even like you know new mexico and it's not like arizona and arizona is not like california they are different very, very different what was it like during the what pandemic like and pandemic lockdowns, lockdowns being on top, on top of everybody below and sides like? it's like? weird because like you're on top of everybody but you're also not allowed to talk to them or interact with them it's very strange I mean, what happened with me was that we just, this was where we didn't have any online teaching at school before COVID. And COVID basically forced online teaching on us. We had to, we, uh, we were, my wife has health issues. She's got, she's got disabilities. And I was debating whether I should keep going to school because hmm. I don't want to bring anything home. And because she's not, this was before the vaccines, you know, this was the beginning. Remember then? Yeah. Right. And, I was thinking, you know, maybe I'm going to have to pull out or do something. I don't know, because I don't want to bring a deadly disease back home to kill my wife. And like within a week, though, they'd already basically, they'd gone from talking about maybe having some cancellations to saying, we're now fully online. And I was like, Psh! so we had to pivot mid-semester. And we've not, even now, we haven't gone back to fully in person. It's about like half my classes are online, the other class are in person. And so all day is this, under lockdown, this is my day, screen. So, you know, I'm already in the room writing a lot of the time, and now I'm in here all the time, interacting with the screen all the time. And, I mean, the one thing, you're in New York, so 
food delivery is amazing, right? You just, you know, I can just get anything delivered, and they just they drop it on the on the front porch and leave, and then you go out and you scurry out and get it safely. So that made COVID real easy to deal with in that sense. Um, but it is very strange. Every you could feel everybody was at home around you. They weren't going to work anymore. The streets were silent, except for sirens. That's what you heard all day. Sirens all day. It was very, very sobering. And it's like that was that was always something there in the background that would keep bringing it home to you. Like, hey, I'm at home fooling around. And think, but you were hearing those sirens outside. And like, that's why you're at home, dumbass. It's because. Um, so you know, it, this was not a, a hard place to be because again, you can I can I do my groceries. I want three minutes. I'm at the store. So if you were willing to wear a mask and go at off hours and so forth, that was feasible. So, but yeah, um, remember there used to be the thing people would do. They clap out their windows or make noise as a way of like at a certain time of day to sort of salute the the healthcare workers and the ambulance drivers. So I remember that. And so there was there that was the one thing. There was a sense we were all in something. There was one thing we were all in. We we're all going through it. And it's like didn't matter who you were, didn't matter what your background was, COVID doesn't care. It'll kill you too. So you you it'll kill anybody. So there was there was a sense too that um you you know, you appreciated it when you saw people ma masking up. And everybody was mad when you didn't <laughs> when they saw people who weren't masking. You could see all these looks. And um, but yeah, there was a feeling of that that it did oddly bring us together in our collective isolation. I guess if that makes sense, and our mm -hmm. that we were all going through it together. So there was at least that, and there were these gestures like clapping at the window, a way of trying to bridge that gap. So you know, I went from never using Zoom for like casual phone calls to using Zoom all the time. It was the only way I could see my family. They're on they're three thousand miles away. Yeah. So that's the only way I could see them. It was Christmas was like this. You know, uh, I never missed a Christmas at home, but did that year. So um, this was, in, in, in some ways, it was a lifesaver in that sense. It was, a, you know, that it meant that we didn't lose touch with folks. But um, so I think in New York, it wasn't this, it was in just being here in, a, in a such a dense place, it made it a bit easier. But um, it also made it more, I mean, after all, it's a dense place. So that disease is it just just rockets right through the city. And so once it shows, shows up, if you get one person on a train car, that's 70 people who got it. And they're all taking it to their train cars and their taxis and their whatever. So, it, you know, the, the threat here was very real. Like people were really, uh, people were going. Like those sirens were going. You knew it was happening. That's a somber note, but there it is. Um, uh, Chris, uh, Canada represent in between <laughs> Toronto and where PL is now. Well, uh, Michael, I know so, we've we've kept. Oh, I'm sorry, PL. Go ahead. No, no, I was I was gonna say. So he's somewhere like Londonish, um, you know, somewhere around there. So gotta hopefully uh, we gotta hook up sometime, my friend. So you should. I'm down. Uh, I'm, I have family all over, and I'm always going one way or the other. So. Hopefully we can meet up sometime. So you see that? You meet you meet in real life. That's what yeah. it's all about. That's what it's all about. Well, I got, the time always flies, and the time gets away from us pretty quickly here, so mm -hmm. we don't want to keep you too much longer. I did have one more question for you. Okay. And that is, what was your first job? Depends on what you mean by job. But, uh, you know, I, I really did the lemonade stand in the front yard thing. I actually did that. Um, but if you want a job job, I think my first formal job was actually working retail in a bookstore. Um, you know, that was, that was a minimum wage, nine to five. And, uh, I don't know how people do it. I was a terrible employee and they got rid of me quick. Um, uh, but, uh, cause I sucked. Uh, you know, it was just, uh, I don't know how people managed to man a register for nine hours a day. I took every pretext to go to gift wrapping because that was a nice peaceful place over here where you could just peacefully wrap your packages and so forth. And that was fine. So that, yeah, that was my first job. 
and uh, it, it bred into me a deep respect for anybody who's got to sit there punching buttons and, and, and taking people's money and not punching them, uh, which I think takes a certain amount of fortitude that I might not have had. Um, so I didn't deck any old ladies. I don't want you to think I was taking pokes at anybody, but there were times it was tempting. So um, yeah, that was my first gig. That was my first job. Yeah, it was book related. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't envy anybody with that gig. That is tough. It's a tough one. Yeah. But I want to thank you for taking your Friday night to hang out with us and spend more time in front of the screen. We, we really appreciate it. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah. No, it was awesome. I enjoyed it very much. Awesome. And uh, before we go, for anyone looking for you or your work, where's the best place to find you or where they can buy your books? Um, let's see. So, Pissed, I think, should be available. If you just go to the Clash website, you can pre-order this one. Uh, it's medium length. Um, this guy you can order from Paul Gray. We're on Amazon. It is a Paul Gray book, so it's going to cost it's going to cost too much. But if um, I'm on Twitter, and what I've been doing is if people are interested in the book and they're not interested in paying a university press price, they can contact me, and I can at least send you a PDF of it. And I don't, I won't ask you for anything for that. I'll just give it to you. Um, for books that are out of print too, it's the same thing. If I have a PDF of it and you DM me, I can just send you the PDF, and then that'll work. Uh, but as far as my my work is concerned, I have a, a website. I think I I think I paid for it this month. I better. But michaelcisco.com is there. Um, but yeah, if nothing else, um, I, I don't do anything on Facebook. Um, and my Instagram is lame, but um, and barely visited. But so Twitter, I think, is a is a is a pretty straightforward place to reach me. Um, you know, for good or ill, I'm still on bleepity beep and bleep and Twitter. Uh, <laughs> but you can contact me there. And um, yeah, I mean, I want people to read my stuff. So if you want to want me to hook you up with a PDF, I will get it to you as best I can. So uh, that's a, that's right now. That's the best place to find me, and um, I'm doing stuff to promote the book. So I mean, I'm doing readings and so forth around. Again, that's on my Twitter page too. Of various events I'm doing in the vicinity. I'm trying to see if I can get some West Coast events lined up uh, too, if possible, because I always go back there at least twice a year to see my folks. So I might be able to do something on the West Coast. I would like to do that very much. Um, yeah. So that that's a an, an, uh, developing story. Uh, as as we say. Nice. And uh, PL, before we go, where's the best place for everyone to find you? Uh, normally beside you and Taylor on uh, page chewing. Um, that's that's probably the, the, the place you can find me on screen. Um, before we go blog, where I'm an assistant editor, and Steve is a blogger, and Taylor's also an assistant editor, so my review's there. And on Goodreads, of course. Um, for the books, uh, www.peelstore.com. That's all about the John Kingdom saga. Um, Two books out, The Last of the Atlanteans and The John King. The third one, Norton King, is coming in the next little while. So that's exciting. And uh, like Michael, I mean, I have Instagram and Facebook, but yeah, I'm, 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 I, and I'm trying to work on getting better on spreading out my social media uh, platforms in terms of how much time I devote to each one, getting more even with that, even distribution. But really, Twitter is my preferred uh, mm -hmm. social media platform, and that's, where you can find me at Peel Start Writes. DMs are open. Message me. You want to talk about literature, writing, business related stuff. You know, yeah, um, that's the best place to get a hold of me. Uh, big shout out quickly to Before We Go Blog and the wonderful Beth Tabler, our fearless leader. And um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's been great speaking to and meeting Michael and hoping to get to read some of his books in the future. And yeah, thank, thanks so much for coming. Yeah, the same. My my heartfelt thank to both, but thanks to both you, PL and and Steve. Thank you very much for having me on the show. Um, I really enjoyed the conversation. Awesome. Well, thank you again, and thanks everyone for coming by and interacting with us in the chat. It's always a great time. So, hope everyone has a great weekend, and we'll talk to everyone soon. <laughs>